Shout out to SeatGeek for sponsoring this video. SeatGeek is the best place to buy tickets online. Use my promo code FOOLISH for $20 off your first purchase. Game rated E for everyone. Hi, I'm Pedro Martinez. In 1995, 23-year-old Pedro Martinez had his first great season in the big leagues with the Montreal Expos. In 1996, he made his first All-Star game. In 1997, he struck out 305 batters and won his first Cy Young Award. In 1998, he moved to Boston and continued his dominance, finishing as the runner-up to Roger Clemens for the league's best pitcher. During that time, he developed a uh, particular set of skills namely three outrageously good pitches, a forcing fastball with movement that went to the upper 90s, a ridiculous curveball, and the real piece de resistance, a changeup he tossed with a circle grip, which is, in my non-expert opinion, the greatest changeup anyone has ever thrown. He also had a cutter and two-seam fastball that he would mix in from time to time. I got more pitches than a used car dealer. I've got more control than an 18 hour bra. I am El Duro. And while 1995 through 1998 really laid the foundations for a historic run, we're not going to talk any more about those years. See, beginning in 1999 and stretching through the end of 2000, Pedro Martinez embarked on a two season stretch of monumental proportions. At the peak of the steroid era, in the high scoring AL East, Pitching in a hitter-friendly ballpark, he completely shut down opposition despite playing in one of the highest scoring run environments ever. In the past, elite pitchers had put up seemingly impossible numbers for a season or two, the high watermark being Bob Gibson's 1968 campaign, where he finished with a 1.12 ERA, a modern record. Pedro didn't quite approach that level of run prevention, but given the era he was pitching in, he made his case for the greatest pitching season of all time twice in a row. Let's talk about his first campaign. Pedro's 1999 season kicked off pretty fast. He exited April with a 2.21 ERA after five starts and delivered a particularly iconic Pedro performance on May 7th against the Angels. His final line, eight innings pitched, six hits, zero walks, zero runs, 15 strikeouts. Now, this is a unique performance worth highlighting. There have only been 51 games in MLB history where a pitcher has struck out at least 15 batters without walking one, and four of those instances belong to Pedro Martinez. Then came the All-Star game. Hometown starter Pedro Martinez getting ready to go in the shadow of the green monster. Baseball after this. Were any Pedro aficionado to rattle off some of his signature moments, Martinez's performance in the 1999 All-Star Game and his home stadium of Fenway Park would rank quite high. The leadoff man? Hall of Famer Barry Larkin. After getting him to a 2-2 count, the always difficult Larkin fouls off fastball after fastball. Keep in mind, Larkin's career high for strikeouts in the season was just 69, so he did a nice job of putting balls in play. And then came that changeup. You think that's sweet? Wait till I drag a Pitching Ninja logo on top of it. After serving up 96, 97, and 98 to Larkin, it's the 85 mile per hour changeup that he's not ready for. Who's up next? Oh, it's our good friend Larry Walker, hitting a reasonable 382 in the first half. But, you know, course. Hmm, gets him to 01 with the off speed stuff, fastball for strike two, and you're done. Sit down. Here's Sammy Sosa fresh off his epic 1998 home run race with Martin McGuire. And oh, there's the changeup again to make it two strikes. And a perfect fastball. Pedro has just struck out three superstars with ease. Second inning now, and the aforementioned McGuire comes to the plate, and he does the exact same thing to him. Changeup to make it two strikes, and he can't catch up to the fastball. It's a good thing Sosa and McGuire were in the National League when they were chasing that home run record. Matt Williams sends a weak ground out to the second baseman thanks to Pedro's curveball and oh no, Rob Yalimar! Doesn't matter though. Pedro strikes out Jeff Bagwell and Pudge Rodriguez guns down Williams trying to steal second base. Just like that, Pedro's legendary all-star game outing is complete. In years past, Pedro had gained a little bit of a reputation for breaking down at the end of seasons. He'd seemingly miss a couple starts here and there, and that happened to some extent as he had his lone blow-up start of the season against the Marlins on July 18th and missed two weeks after that. What didn't happen, though, was a September slowdown. 
Pedro's last two Septembers hadn't been terrible, but they had been a little unpedro like having posted a 3-4-1 ERA in 97 and a 4-1-5 in 98. So how did he do in September of 1999? Oh, that's a lot lower. Pedro pitched five gems that September, with inning totals that looked like this, earned run totals that looked like this, and strikeout totals that looked like this. It's no wonder his results ended up looking like this. The most memorable of these starts came in enemy territory, when he struck out 17 Yankees while only allowing one hit, a solo home run to Chili Davis. Pedro ended 1999 with 23 wins, a 207 ERA, and 313 strikeouts across 213 and third innings. But there's more going on below the surface. See, you can assess a pitcher's performance through their results, such as their ERA, but there's also peripherals that try to tell us how well they are pitching regardless of outcome. How about FIP? Short for Fielding Independent Pitching, this stat looks at the three true outcomes, walks, homers, and strikeouts, to predict a player's ERA using only instances where fielding isn't involved. Pedro struck out 13.2 batters per 9 innings, which actually set a major league record for qualified pitchers at the time. He walked just 1.6 batters per 9, which is a trait that really separated him from the strikeout artists of his time. He was just so pinpoint, which gave him an absurd 8.46 strikeout per walk ratio. But then, there's the homers. The sweet, sweet homers. The American League averaged 1.16 homers per 9 innings that season, but Pedro decided that allowing homers is for suckers, so he allowed .38. That's a grand total of 9 home runs and 835 batters faced. That's astounding for the height of the steroid era. So, in total, his fielding independent pitching came out to 1.39. Wow. That means if you look at the true outcomes, his expected ERA was significantly lower than his actual ERA. FIP isn't some amazing tell-all stat, but he definitely underperformed that particular peripheral. In fact, that's the best FIP any pitcher has had since Babe Ruth started clobbering homers, and it's really not particularly close. But he wasn't done yet. Boston finished the 1999 season with 94 wins and grabbed the AL wildcard spot. In the division series, they faced off against a stacked Cleveland Indians team that was the first to score over 1,000 runs since the Red Sox did it themselves in 1950. Naturally, Pedro took the mound for Game 1, but was pulled in the fifth inning with the Red Sox leading 2-0 after injuring his back. With Boston's ace out of the mix, Cleveland rallied back with a Jim Tomey two-run homer to tie the game in the sixth inning, and a Travis Fryman walk-off single ended it in the ninth. The series continued without any more appearances from the ailing Pedro Martinez, and it all came to a head in the winner-take-all Game 5 at Jacobs Field. Facing the best offense in baseball, veteran Brett Saberhagen was pulled in the second inning after allowing five runs. Youngster Derek Lowe came in, and he didn't pitch too well either, allowing three runs. After Lowe allowed a two-run home run to Jim Tomey, an angelic figure appeared in the bullpen. The injured Pedro Martinez was warming up. See, this wasn't a blowout. Boston's offense was somehow keeping pace, and the score stood tied at 8-8 entering the bottom of the fourth. Despite the early onslaught of runs, the teams were on even footing. No one knew how long Pedro would be able to go, or who the Red Sox could possibly call on next. But once he entered the game in the fourth, the devastating Cleveland Bats came to a screeching halt. He got Sandy Alomar and Kenny Lofton to ground out, with the latter injuring himself on a headfirst slide. Then, Omar Vizquel lined out to first base. Pedro Martinez had a 1-2-3 inning to start his appearance. In the fifth, Pedro was given the Herculean task of facing the heart of Cleveland's order. Hall of Famer Robbie Alomar grounded out which was Pedro exacting his revenge for Alomar flubbing that grounder in the All-Star game, I'm sure. Then, one of the best right-handed hitters of all time and future Red Sox teammate Manny Ramirez walked, giving Pedro his first base runner. Well, at least it can't get any worse than that. Ah, oh, wait, just kidding. There's Hall of Famer Jim Tomey, who had already hit a whopping four homers in the five-game series. Somehow, he gets Jim Tomey out on the most awkward of strikeouts, as Tomey believed he fouled off this pitch. That's just a lucky break that Pedro Martinez might need. What are the odds that Cleveland has yet another Hall of Famer lurking behind the great Jim Tomey? Oh, that's right, they had Harold Baines too. I think I understand how they scored a thousand runs now. But Pedro was just too good that night, and a perfectly placed fastball on the 1-2 pitch retires Baines looking. In the top of the 7th, with two runners on, 
Boston left fielder Troy O'Leary broke the game open with a three-run jack to give Boston an 11-8 lead. But such a lead was fragile, and it would require more pitching heroics to maintain it against a Cleveland lineup that looked like this. Wow. Speaking of future Pedro Martinez teammates, how about Dave Roberts subbing in for the injured Kenny Lofton? Baseball really is a small world. So, in your first six lineup spots, you have a borderline Hall of Famer who got massively snubbed, a potential Hall of Famer currently on the ballot, a Hall of Famer, someone with a Hall of Fame career who only won't get in due to failed drug tests, a Hall of Famer, and Harold Baines, who is also somehow in the Hall of Fame. Just absolutely stacked. Yet Pedro continued to mow them down. Were the Red Sox leading 12-8 going into the ninth inning, they were just three outs away. Surely Martinez must be too sore to continue. Upon his induction into the Red Sox Hall of Fame, Pedro looked back at this gutsy performance with some serious perspective. He stated that the decision to pitch that day put everything on the line, even his future health and career. But as the ninth inning kicked off, he remained on the mound to close out the Cleveland Indians. The first batter, Enrique Wilson, grounded out to Nomar Garcia Parra. Next up was Dave Roberts, who lined out also to Garcia Parra. That made Omar Vizquel the last man standing, and with this 0 2 pitch, Pedro ended Cleveland's terrific season prematurely. His final stat line six innings pitched, three walks, eight strikeouts, zero runs, zero hits. That's right. Pedro no hit one of the best offenses in baseball history for six innings when his team needed it most. A legendary performance in the playoffs. The Red Sox would end up falling to the Yankees in five games in the American League Championship Series, but it was hardly Pedro's fault. He outdueled Roger Clemens in Game 3 to the tune of seven scoreless innings and 12 strikeouts, giving Boston their only win of the series. In total, Pedro pitched 17 scoreless innings in the playoffs that year against some of the toughest competition imaginable. His team just let him down. As you can imagine, he was awarded the Cy Young that year, and finished second in MVP voting to Pudge Rodriguez in what was an extremely close race. In fact, Pedro ended up receiving more first place votes than the Hall of Fame catcher. And thus ends our video on Pedro's legendary 1999 season. Please don't hesitate to check out my sponsor's C- Oh! Oh sorry, my producer is telling me something. He did it again? In 2000? Well, we should probably talk about that. With an amazing 1999 behind him, Pedro began his 2000 season in typical Pedro fashion. He won his first five starts in April, pitching seven innings in all of them, and finishing with a 1.27 ERA. As great of a month that is, May is where things started to get really interesting. On May 6th, Martinez dueled the Devil Rays in Fenway. Like his duel with the Yankees in 99, Pedro pitched nine innings and struck out 17 batters. So here's a quick fun fact for you. Besides Pedro Martinez, the only pitchers in MLB history with multiple games of at least 17 strikeouts are Nolan Ryan, Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens, Max Scherzer, Sandy Koufax, and Bob Feller. And with Pedro throwing these two games within six months of another, it's safe to say he was at his absolute peak. But here's something lousy, he actually lost the game. He allowed a run as the Red Sox were shut out by Steve's Traxel, and this is a theme that would continue throughout his season. On the 12th of May, Pedro took the hump against another division rival in the Orioles, throwing a complete game shutout and striking out 15. You best believe he got the win for that one. At the end of the month, Pedro Martinez and Roger Clemens were set up for the duel of the season on ESPN's Sunday Night Baseball, and the two did not disappoint. Pedro and the Red Sox had handily defeated Clemens in Game 3 of the ALCS the previous year, but the Rocket brought his A game this time around. Thankfully, so did Pedro Martinez. The game was tied going into the ninth inning, when Trot Nixon broke the game open with a two-run homer off Clemens. The Yankees were able to load the bases against Pedro in the bottom half of the final inning, but he pitched out of it. It was another legendary performance against Boston's eternal rivals, and it dropped his ERA to a seemingly impossible 1.05. As the Red Sox ace pitcher, much of Pedro's success was going to be measured by his performance against the Yankees, and he always delivered. Between 1999 and 2000, Martinez started 7 games against the Bronx Bombers, accumulating a 4-2 record, 74 strikeouts in 53 innings, and a 1.70 ERA. Keep in mind, the Yankees won both World Series in this time frame. 
Naturally, he tossed more masterpieces as the season went along. On July 23rd, he tossed a 15 strikeout complete game shutout as the Red Sox defeated the White Sox 1 to nothing. On August 29th, he exacted his revenge on the Devil Rays by striking out 13 in a complete game, one hit shutout to give him his 15th win of the season. The season wrapped up, and Pedro's 2000 might have just beaten out his legendary 1999. For starters, his ERA of 1.74 is an incredible feat, but we'll soon learn just how special that number really was in an environment of high octane offenses. But one of the most memorable stats from this season is his whip, or walks plus hits over innings pitched. It's a stat that basically tells you how many base runners this pitcher allows per inning. His was .737, the lowest in MLB history. Let me repeat myself. At the height of the steroid era, Pedro Martinez allowed walks and hits at a lower rate than any other pitcher in the entire history of baseball had, and it's a record that still stands today. And the sad thing is, the new millennium edition of Pedro Martinez didn't pitch in the playoffs that season, as Boston only won 86 games. Some of his teammates' shortcomings can be surmised from Pedro's win-loss record of 18-6. and six. In those six losses, Pedro averaged 8 innings per start and had a 2-4-4 ERA, these were his losses. Even in Jacob deGrom's 2018 season, which was legendary for this sort of thing, he had a 271 ERA. That's higher than Pedro's. So, it's time we talked about that ERA, because it's amazing. But for the more casual fans who aren't familiar with newer metrics, please pay close attention to this part. Pedro Martinez had a 174 ERA in 2000. That's ridiculous, but it has been beaten. In fact, it has been bested 84 times since the creation of the American League in 1901. Most of it has been done by guys who pitched before Babe Ruth kicked run scoring into high gear, like Dutch Leonard, who holds the record with a .96 ERA in 1914. But then there's Sandy Koufax, who had a 174 in 1964 and a 173 in 1966. Bob Gibson's 1.12 set the mark for modern baseball history, and even Jacob deGrom finished with a 1.70 just last year. Those guys didn't pitch in the type of run environments that Pedro Martinez did in 2000. Pure and simple. Dutch Leonard in 1914? Well, the average American League ERA that season was 273, and in the 1968 year of the pitcher, the National League's was 2.99, and even the 2018 National League had an average ERA of 4.03. But the American League in 2000? That's an ERA of nearly 5. 4.92 to be exact. Here are all the American League pitchers who pitched enough innings to qualify and kept an ERA below 4 in the year 2000. You have large attractive Bartolo Colon, not Mike Soroka, Mike Sorotka, Mike Mussina, and finally Roger Clemens with a 3.70. And then there's Pedro. Do you get it? Do you see it? Nearly a two run difference between him and Clemens. That's probably the most anyone has ever deserved a Cy Young award so it shouldn't be a surprise that he grabbed that honor. There's actually a stat that normalizes a pitcher's ERA based on the run scoring environment. It's called ERA+. Plus. It adjusts to each ballpark and the amount of offense to give pitchers across different eras a fair playing field. 100 is always average, and an ERA plus of 160 or higher will usually land you in Cy Young discussions. Pedro's ERA plus in 2000 was 291. He was about three times better than the average pitcher at run prevention. It's better than Dutch Leonard in 1914. It's better than Bob Gibson in 1968. It's the best ERA plus in MLB history. When you adjust for his insane run environment, Pedro Martinez's 2000 season was the best at run prevention. Ever. Oh, oh, and before I see some of you typical Tim Key fanboys in my comments section, that chump only tossed 105 innings in 1880, okay? I don't care what his ERA plus was. The American Association didn't even exist yet, much less the American League. Pedro is the best pitcher who qualifies by today's standards. Gosh, I hate Tim Key fanboys. They're so relentless with their talking points. With the 1999 season, we talked about peripherals. In that case, FIP, fielding independent pitching. 2000 was the season about results on the field, so we focused on the actual outcome of Pedro's pitching in the form of ERA and ERA+. The truth is, both these seasons were immaculately pitched, and I'm not quite sure if I can say which one was actually the best, but they each make a case for being the best pitched season of all time. But even more than that, an examination of these two seasons opens the door for even greater discussion, which is why I want to close with a piece on the GOAT conversation.
Is the greatest of all time worth debating? It's basically a hack bit at this point, and it requires us to compare athletes across wildly different eras. How does one compare Ruth to Bonds? It's not an easy endeavor. I'm not going to tell anyone how to live their life or enjoy their sports, but let me say this on behalf of Pedro Martinez. Sandwiched within a wonderful career, he put down two seasons that each have a case for the finest season ever pitched. An explosive pitcher with a small frame, he struggled with durability for much of his career. He only won 219 games and generated about 84 wins above replacement, and he was only 33 when he pitched his last full injury-free season. If counting stats are the measuring stick, Pedro is a Hall of Famer, but still far away from many pitchers. But when you remember someone as being the greatest, you'll likely emphasize what they were like at their very best. And this is where Pedro shines, because as evidenced by his 1999 and 2000 campaigns, his very best was better than anyone else's very best. I truly believe that much. And if you expand it to the seven year peaks we studied in my Clayton Kershaw video, he certainly stands out as well. Potential nominees for the greatest pitcher of all time come from all eras. Cy Young has stats that will never be caught. Walter Johnson has as good a case as any. Perhaps you prefer one of the great arms of the 1960s, like Koufax or Gibson. Maybe you love the ultimate flamethrower Nolan Ryan, or the ultimate control freak Greg Maddox. I think there's easily 10-15 to 15 guys who have made serious cases for being the greatest of all time at one point or another. One could easily argue the merits of Christy Mathewson, Satchel Paige, Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens, Clayton Kershaw, Brad Radke? Oh, well, well, okay, probably not Brad Radke, but he, he was an underrated pitcher. Greatness could be the best counting stats, the most accomplishments and awards, the most raw talent, or the best peak. There's many ways of looking at such a concept. The point of the video is not to convince you that Pedro Martinez is the greatest pitcher of all time. I'm not so sure of that myself, although I do think the GOAT is either him, Walter Johnson, or Greg Maddox. No, the point of the video is to simply talk about someone who reached the absolute peak of the art form. I've received a few requests to do a video on Bob Gibson in 1968. You have to understand, this is my Bob Gibson in 1968. It's just Pedro Martinez, and it's two seasons, not one. So, I'll leave you with this much on the greatest of all time conversation. If you want to have an earnest discussion about who the best pitcher in baseball history is, and you're not including Pedro Martinez, then you're doing yourself a huge disservice, because your conversation is incomplete. Cue the where are they now. This episode of Baseball Bits was brought to you by SeatGeek. SeatGeek is an app that makes ticket buying ridiculously easy. They rate each deal on a scale of 1 to 10 and show you pictures from each vantage point, so you'll know exactly what your view at Fenway Park will look like on game day. You can order through your browser, or if you're on mobile, you can download the app right in my video's description. So, if you want to catch a ball game with these tight playoff races going on and support the channel, use my code FOOLISH for $20 off your first purchase. Once again, big shout out to SeatGeek for sponsoring this episode of Baseball Bits.